Hello, and welcome to another Emerald Scientific webinar. Today's topic is phytocannabinoid known unknowns. This webinar is sponsored by Cayman Chemical. I will be your moderator today. My name is Kirsten Blake, Vice President of Emerald Scientific. Today's presenter will be Jeffrey B. Williams, Scientist 3. Jeffrey Williams is a scientist in the Process Exploration Chemistry Department at Cayman Chemical and has been an integral part of the company's forensic chemistry division over the past five years. He has received an MS in chemistry from the University of Michigan in 2003 prior to joining Cayman in 2004. His research focuses on synthesis and characterization of reference standards for phytocannabinoids, opiates, and benzodiazepine chemical classes. Just a quick housekeeping note, if you have a question during the presentation, please click on the down arrow in the right control panel and you will be able to type in your questions. All questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. We are so pleased to have you with us today, Jeffrey. Please take it from here. Thank you, Kirsten. Today, I'll discuss the chemistry behind degradation seen in cannabis-derived products. I hope that by identifying these degradants and the chemistry behind their formation, it will help improve your workflow in providing the highest quality phytocannabinoid products. Cayman Chemical is located in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we provide phytocannabinoid analytical standards. These standards are available as certified reference materials, or CRMs, for both single component phytocannabinoids and mixtures that allow for their quantitation in cannabis products. We're a dedicated group of scientists helping make research possible in the cannabis and phytocannabinoid fields. I want to start today's discussion with focusing on the phytocannabinoid biosynthesis. The cannabis plant uses biosynthetic pathways to generate several structurally diverse phytocannabinoids. These pathways share in common the condensation of geronyl pyrophosphate with a resource anolic acid core to provide cannabigerolic acid or CBGA. For this presentation, I'll be focusing mainly on the resource anols with a five carbon chain, which is the olivitol series. Alternative alkyl chain links of one, three, four, six, and seven, corresponding to the Orson, Varin, Butyl, Hexyl, and Ferrol series are also known. While these phytohomologs are often very minor components in the plant, the literature has started to show that some may actually have poten potentially higher psychoactivity than THC itself. So it's important to remember that the chemistry I discuss can also be applied to all the varying chain link phytocannabinoids as well. Once CBGA is formed in the plant, it can proceed down three distinct biosynthetic pathways. CBGA can cyclize to form cannabichrominic acid, or CBCA, by the action of CBCA synthase, or it can undergo oxidative cyclization by the action of CBDA synthase to give the substituted cyclohexene ring structure known as cannabidiolic acid, or CBDA. Finally, CBGA can be acted upon by THCA synthase for cyclization to delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinolic acid A, or THCAA. The phytocannabinoid acids are the precursors to all the neutral phytocannabinoids isolated from the cannabis plant. So today's discussion will focus on the phytocannabinoids from these last two pathways, CBDA and THCAA. To isolate the neutral phytocannabinoids, the phytoacids must first be decarboxylated. This reaction involves the elimination of the carboxylic acid through the loss of CO2, which results in the formation of the neutral phytocannabinoid. In this case, we see delta-9-THCAA is decarboxylated to delta-9-THC. This process may occur to a small extent in the plant and is accelerated by heat so that during smoking of cannabis inflorescences or flowers, the decarboxylation provides the psychoactive compounds for inhalation. The cannabis oil from the extraction process also requires decarboxylation to occur before the distillation step. 
the processing of the plant material to make the cannabis extracts and isolates is a primary source for the introduction of phytocannabinoid byproducts, including isomerization, oxidation, and degradation. Uh, these byproducts may have some biological activity, and it's important to understand the conditions under which they form in order to both identify and avoid them. So over the next couple of slides, I'm going to discuss how these impurities are formed and what to be aware of. The first isomerization byproduct I'm going to discuss is likely the most well-known. It's delta-8 THC. The isolation of delta-9 THC is complicated by the instability of the delta-9 isomer relative to delta-8. In the presence of acidic conditions, the delta-9 torsional ring strain is relieved through protonation, followed by elimination of the C8 hydrogen. This isomerization can be accelerated by heating, and it's even known to occur over time as the inflorescences or the extracts are stored. To date, it's not believed that the delta-8 isomer is actually plant-derived metabolite, but it's merely a byproduct of processing. The delta-8 THC isomer is also known to be psychoactive, with about half the activity reported for delta-9 THC. It's not the only THC isomer, though. There's another set of isomers that can be formed uh, from delta-9 THC under basic conditions. Delta-9 THC is known to isomerize under basic conditions as the relative acidity of the C10A hydrogen increases as it's both benzylic relative to the resorcinol and allylic to the C9 olefin. Isomerization to delta-10 THC provides two diastereomers, which are separable by chromatography. The literature indicates that both delta-10 diastereomers are inactive for psychoactivity. And this is really interesting because we've started to see some cannabis processors offering delta-10 THC claiming psychoactivity similar to delta-8 and delta-9 THC. It's difficult to know what step these processors are forming these isomers and which isomer they're actually isolating. However, I think it most likely occurs during distillation and it may be from the presence of some minor alkaline contaminant from an earlier processing step. Identification of the delta-10 THC isomers is also complicated by the fact that it both can isomerize readily to another conjugated THC. Isomerization of delta-10 THC to delta-6A-10A THC occurs in the presence of acid. The stereospecificity of this reaction means that the 9S delta 10 THC diastereomer provides only the 9S delta 6A 10A THC isomer. Likewise, the 9R delta 10 THC provides only the 9R delta 6A 10A THC. The 9R and 9S THC the 9R and 9S isomers of delta 6A 10A are themselves enantiomers and they can be separated using chiral HPLC methods. Both enantiomers were tested for activity back in the 1980s with initial human tests showing mild psychoactive effects for the 9S delta 6A 10A isomer with reported activity of approximately 10 to 30% relative to delta 9 THC. Additional animal testing models on the 9R delta 6A 10A THC enantiomer showed minimal to no psychoactivity. Formation of the delta-10 and delta-6A-10A THC isomers generates a conjugated uh, system through the double bond and the resorcinol ring system, which changes the UV profile of these compounds. I've seen it reported a couple of places where people are misidentifying these as CBC. As you can see, there are similar UV profiles in this comparison of the spectra of delta-10 in red, delta 6A, 10A in blue, and CBC in green. The chromatography for the delta 10 and delta 6A, 10A THCs can also be very complex. Under your typical reverse phase HPLC conditions, the mixture of the four isomers is very difficult to resolve. We found that using a chiral stationary phase is necessary to resolve the two diastereomeric delta 10 THC compounds from the two enantiomeric delta-6A-10A THCs. 
We're currently preparing an application note highlighting these findings. I want to now shift our attention to the reactions of cannabidiol. Cannabidiol, or CBD, serves as another way to access the THC structure, and one that some people appear to be exploring and exploiting. Under acidic conditions, CBD can cyclize to delta-9 THC, but this cyclization is difficult to control as it usually involves heating to increase the rate and overall conversion of the reaction. Heating with an acid catalyst present leads to a mixture with delta-8 THC, which as I previously discussed is a major degradant of delta-9 THC. Over time, as CBD is fully converted, the delta-8 isomer will become the major isolated product of this reaction. Another pathway also exists where cyclization can occur to the cyclohexene ring to provide a new bicyclic tetrahydrocannabinol structure, which is referred to as ISO-THC. This ISO-THC was first described by Meshulam's lab and uses the monoterpene nomenclature. As you can see, the initially formed delta-8 ISO-THC structure is very different from the delta-8 THC structure that we've previously discussed. Additionally, the delta-8 ISO-THC isomer that forms readily isomerizes under acidic conditions to provide two other ISO-THCs, delta-4-8 ISO-THC and delta-4 ISO-THC. There's very little known about the biological activity of these ISO-THCs and they primarily present themselves as interferences in the HPLC baselines for THC isolates formed from this CBD cyclization. Now that we've seen what happens to CBD under acidic conditions, let's explore the reaction of CBD under basic conditions. The treatment of CBD under basic conditions is also known as the Bean test, which was described in the early 20th century by Dr. William Bean as a colometric test. Under the test conditions, CBD is treated with a 5% potassium hydroxide solution in ethanol. And over time, it produces this very vibrant purple colored solution. The CBD is actually being oxidized under these alkaline conditions to monomeric and dimeric hydroxyquinones, which Meshulam's lab was able to identify. The monomeric hydroxyquinone CBDQ also called HU331, is void of phytomimetic activity, but it has been shown to be a potent anti-cancer agent. Isolation of CBDQ is possible, but it's also proven unstable in both protic and aprotic solvents, and it usually generates the dimeric species and other identified, unidentified degradants. This instability along with the toxicity issues was responsible for its lack of drug development. While the beam test has previously been used as a forensic technique to detect marijuana, it is now known that THC does not provide a positive result under these conditions. Activation of the resorcinol ring and subsequent oxidation requires that both free hydroxyls uh, exist. Other quinones of the phytocannabinoids are also known to exist. Quinones of the phy major phytocannabinoids have all been reported as highly colored species. Like CBDQ, these phytocannabinoid quinones have been shown to have activity in PPAR gamma assays. They also have similar stability issues with activity dropping off with the formation of those dimeric species. The highly colored nature of these quinones could explain some of the color changes observed in isolated cannabis extracts. They all also represent just one pathway for oxidation of the phytocannabinoids. There are other pathways as well. Cannabinol, or CBN, was the first phytocannabinoid isolated at the end of the 19th century from a cannabis oil extract. Cannabinol is an oxidative degradant that can form in cannabis products with a psychoactivity of approximately 10% when compared to delta-9 THC. The mechanism by which THC is oxidized to cannabinol is poorly understood, and most likely there are several different mechanisms at play uh, in these different oxidative reactions. What is known is that under prolonged exposure to oxygen, light, and high temperatures, the aromatization reaction in 
accelerates. In addition to the isolated extracts, this degradation can actually occur in the harvested plant material with delta-9 THCAA providing CBNA, which upon decarboxylation provides the CBN. As CBN is often considered an uh, isolation artifact, handling and storage are very important for minimizing and avoiding this degradation. Finally, I've shown several degradation pathways available for the phytocannabinoids. Some of these degradants, such as delta-8, are well known, while others, such as delta-10 THC, are starting to appear in various marketplaces. The diversity of the phytocannabinoids and their exponential growth in research on the chemical constituents of cannabis can still provide us with new unknowns. Better knowledge of the chemistry behind their degradation allows for fast identification and a more robust means to avoid their formation and provide the highest quality products possible. Cayman wants to be your source for high quality phytocannabinoid standards and research tools. I want to thank Emerald Scientific for the opportunity to present today, and I thank you for your time. Oh, that was so informative. Thank you, Jeffrey. We really appreciate you uh, doing this webinar today. Please note that the Cayman products or any products noted in this presentation are available at emeraldscientific.com. And if you missed any portion of today's webinar, it can be viewed at community.emeraldscientific.com. And before we jump into questions, just a quick reminder that our next webinar is Tuesday, April 6th, where, where Wes Burke will host InterScience on the topic of automation of the microbi of microbiology analysis workflow in the cannabis industry. So let's start with some questions here. Great. Oh, and we are rolling in. So uh, let's see. The first one here is, did you add other cannabinoids to that to see if you have interference with them? Uh, I guess we're talking about the Delta-10 uh, and Delta-6A10 ATHCs. Um, no, we did not see if that method was able to, uh, to avoid coalition of other phytocannabinoids. Those were just the four isomers that we were seeing if we could separate out those uh, for better identification. Um, the app note that I mentioned will give you a, a good starting point um, whereby you can develop your own method for, um, for seeing if any other phytocannabinoids coalute. Okay. The next question is, oh, yes, a recording of this pre presentation will be provided on our um, Emerald Community website. Uh, let's see, next question here is, uh, oh, same question. <laughs> I think will the presentation made by the speaker be available? Uh, you, the recording will be on our Emerald Community website. Uh, let's see, the next one is, do you have NMR spectroscopy data to confirm the THC anatomers and, sorry, this is beyond me, diastereomer uh, structures? Yes. Uh, so going back to the Delta 6A, 10As, and the Delta 10s, um, we did have and do have NMRs of both Delta 10, the 9S, and the 9R. They are different by NMR, and they are different from the uh, Delta 6A, 10A NMRs. Now, enantiomers themselves, the NMRs of enantiomers are going to be the exact same because they're mirror images. So uh, you need the chiral HPLC method or optical rotation, which we have both, to confirm that we have uh, the 9R and the 9S uh, 6A, 10A um, isomers. Um, I will say a note about the NMR for the delta tens, we did observe that the delta tens, um, a typical NMR solvent is usually deuterated chloroform. And we saw isomerization even in the NMR tube over time of the 9S or 9R delta 10 into the 9S or 9R delta 6A, 10A THC isomers. So we've moved to uh, doing our NMRs in both DMSO D6 or methanol D4 
uh, for confirmation of those diastereomers and the enantiomers that, uh, from the acid isomerization of delta 10. Um, so yes, we have all of those for confirmation. All right, the next one is, we've got a comment and a question. Great talk, fascinating chemistry. Is the chemistry published? They'd like to see the study, they'd like to study it some more. Um, there are some older uh, publications. Some of uh, some of Meshulam's work is, is published uh, on these different isomers. Um, we have, uh, like I said, the, the app note will give some ideas. Uh, we have a, a couple of reviews um, on the Cayman website. We have a Cayman Currents, which we reviewed some of these different isomerizations and degradation pathways. Um, but there are literature-backed uh, reactions. Uh, the, the, the cannabis field itself is full of a rich history of, of um, rich organic chemistry where people have studied these throughout the last 50 years. Um, so we're re relying on that literature, but we're also studying it ourselves uh, and coming up with new data. That's fantastic. Okay, the next one is, is it possible to convert THC to CBD? Uh, to go backwards. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's purely speculative. I've seen a couple of posters at uh, some presentations where people have done that. It's not very efficient. Um, it's nothing that you would want to do. Uh, but it is possible to do. Um, I would just, I hesitate to say, yes, you can do it because uh, we haven't done it to date uh, that way. Um, there are better ways to form CBD and to isolate CBD than to go backwards from THC. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, has it been possible to separate Delta-8 from the isomers of ISO-D8? Yes, there's there's a couple of publications. There was a new uh, Journal of Natural Products paper that discussed ISO THC, and I noticed that they have um, they have very close elution, even in their HPLC method of delta eight and ISO delta eight THC. Uh, I will say they are hard to distinguish. Uh, we do have a couple of we're working right now to isolate those materials. Uh, and hopefully provide a standard in the future. Um, but separation of those is will be very taxing uh, if it's possible at all. Okay. Uh, next, could you please recommend a reference available in the literature that includes description of these conversion reactions? Maybe um, that's something we could follow up with in an email. Yes, I think that would be excellent because I I know of the reference that I could refer to, but I, I might want to know which which reactions, or if they just want to know about all the reactions, then we can. I have two different publications I can think of. Okay, good. All right, the next. Have you observed side chain hydroxylated or other oxidative degradants? For example, the metabolite like 11 dash OH dash THC or 7-OH dash CBD. Uh, those are are thought to be uh, minor metabolites. So the hydroxylated along the the alkyl chain. Um, it's possible that we can provide analytical standards for those, uh, but because they're usually much much more minor than the 11 for the THC series or the 7 for the uh, CBD series. Um, we have not uh, we have not explored those as well for reference standards, but if if there's enough interest in the community, definitely we we will provide those as analytical standards. Okay. Next question: How are you characterizing the reaction intermediates? Real time IR, real time NMR, or kinetic studies? Ah. Uh, um, so the reaction intermediates uh, are 
most of the ones I put on the, the slide today were uh, were your basic organic chemistry uh, mechanisms. We we usually are analyzing the starting materials and the products, uh, and then using our background as uh, organic chemists to figure out the rest. Um, so we, there's not really a need to monitor them uh, during the reaction itself. Okay. And um, quick question, does Cayman Chemical, will they provide custom uh, metabolite reference standards? I'm sorry, could you repeat the first part of that question? Oh, uh, can Cayman Chemical provide custom metabolite reference standards? Uh, yes, we have a, uh, on our website, we have a, a way for you to submit a uh, custom request for us to, to evaluate for um, analytical standards. We also have a wonderful sales team that can take any inquiries and we can, uh, we can definitely determine if that's a metabolite that uh, we can access synthetically and, and provide for the future. And you can also work with your Emerald sale, Emerald Scientific sales representative to um, work in conjunction with Cayman Chemical to find the products that will meet your, your needs. Absolutely. Um, okay, next question. How readily does oxidation of the THC to CBN occur? Um, so there's, there's reports in the literature where it's occurring. You see about a five weight percent loss. Uh, Per month over time, but that the TH, all of the THC is, it's not a 100% conversion rate. Um, you don't go from 100 MIGs of THC down to 96 MIGs of CBN. Uh, you do lose some to other oxidative products along the way. Um, so uh, over time, you'll, you will lose some, and obviously it, you can accelerate that reaction uh, with oxygen or heating. Uh, but you're not going to be your your material that you get out at the end won't be all CBN. Okay, and let's see, getting close to the end of our time here. But how prevalent are these newer phytocannabinoids with four and seven carbons? Uh, yes, those are those are really coming um, to the forefront of the literature, and we've seen a lot of, of talk about those uh, under on different cannabis forums. Um, there was actually a, a paper from this year from the Journal of Natural Products where they were looking for uh, THCP, uh, the Ferrol series or the seven carbon chain. And uh, they were seeing about, I think it was a hundredth of a weight percent in some uh, North American domestic cannabis plants. And so I would imagine over time, if we, there are selective breeding programs, we might actually start to see plants with higher weight percentages of those uh, seven or four carbon chains, or even the, the more recently discovered six carbon chain. Um, it, it just takes people looking for them and identifying those plants where it's growing. Okay, great. Well, I think that takes us to the end of our time. Um, if it, there are additional questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to your contacts at Emerald Scientific. And we, if we didn't answer your question uh, today, we do get a, a report of all the questions and we'll make sure to follow up, with you, follow up with you. If you have questions specific about products, um, we can definitely work with you and Cayman Chemical to provide any quotes um, and note availability of any specific uh, items that you're looking for. Thank you for joining us today.